Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to all of my family on. I'm excited to be with you on yet another uh, evening. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about some notes from the book. Uh, um, the Audacity of Marriage. This is my latest book, 10 Principles to Lifelong Partnership. And I wanted to talk about this because there are so many people who are single and in committed relationships uh, who have purchased this book but want to know a little bit more. And so what I promised that we would do in 2017 is really dig in deep and give a lot of explanation to the things that you're going to be discovering. And so tonight I want to talk to you about something called the four seasons of a successful relationship, okay? So this particular message really is for that non-married person. So whether you're single or you're dating or you're in a non-married committed courtship, <clears throat> I want to share with you some things that I think will be very encouraging. Now, the four seasons. Now, if we think about this earth, there are four seasons in the earth realm. You have summer, spring, winter, and fall. And each season brings about different weather, different climate, and based upon those conditions, uh, you are required to make adjustments in order to properly function within that season. So let me give you an example. So I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, and so you may be in different parts of the country. Wherever you may be, here's the question. What is the, uh, what is the coldest month of the year? Wherever you are in the States or wherever you are in the world, there is that particular month that is the coldest month of the year. Whatever that month is, I want you to think about that month. Now, for some of you, it could get as cold as 20%, you know, 20 degrees, or for others, it could be 20 degrees below zero. It just depends upon where you are. But the question would become, as cold as it does get, what would happen if you walked outside with a t-shirt and shorts on? Well, nine times out of 10, you will freeze. You will catch hypothermia. You may catch, uh, you may get frostbite. You may even die because you are not properly dressed for that cold weather. And so the season itself, you're not properly adjusted to. So let me ask the question, what would happen uh, if it was the hottest month of the year? Wherever you may be in the world, what is the hottest month of the year and how hot could it actually get? Some places it can get as hot as 100 degrees, some 110, some 120. Well, however hot it may be, what would happen if you walked outside with a corduroy jumpsuit on? <laughs> you will probably burn up. You'll catch heat stroke. You may even die. Well, what's the point? The point is you have to learn how to properly adjust to the season that you're in in order to properly graduate into the next season. Does that make sense? Well, likewise, in the realm of our relationships, there are four seasons, four seasons to a successful relationship. First, you have what is called the dating season. Then you have committed courtship. Third, you have engagement. And fourth, you have marriage. Now, the first season is what we refer to as the dating season. That is the selection process. The second season is committed courtship. That is what I call the getting to know you phase. The third season is the season of engagement. Uh, that should be the season of preparation. And the fourth season is what we call marriage, of course, and that should be the final frontier. Now, with each season comes a different level of responsibilities and obligations and commitment. And so for order, in order for you to transition properly throughout each season, you're going to have to learn the rules of engagement. I find it quite interesting. I meet so many single men and women who will tell you that they will make the perfect husband or the perfect wife, that being in a relationship with me would be the best thing that could ever happen to a particular individual. However, they don't know how to date. So because they don't know how to date, they never get to the relationship because the skill sets that are required to be in a dating season are completely different than the skill sets that are required to be in any of the other seasons. So it requires a level of knowledge and understanding. Sometimes you have to relearn all that you have done because as we're here in 2017, let me tell you something, the dating scene is completely different today than it was when I was dating. I've been married now for 14 years, going on 15. If 
I tried to step out into the dating season, God forbid, I would have a rude awakening because there are new nuances and challenges and idiosyncrasies and all types of things to deal with. So you have to become knowledgeable about three things. And I like to compare it to if you're in your profession. If any of you have a job, in order to be successful in that job, you're told you have to know three things. Number one, you have to learn the product or service that you represent. Number two, you have to learn the company that you work for. And number three, you need to understand the industry that the company is in. So the product or service, number one, the company, number two, the industry, number three. Likewise, when it comes to a successful relationship, you've got to understand the person, the gender that you're dating, number one. So if you're a man, you have to understand your particular woman, number one. Number two, you must understand women in general, okay? And number three, you must have an idea of relationships in general. Now, why is this so important? Because what happens is if I'm dating Clarice and that relationship doesn't work out and I end it and then I transition into a relationship with Hafiza and that doesn't work out and now I'm in a relationship with Ashinkashe, what happens is I'm now comparing one person to the next, not realizing that each of them have their own individuality. So one didn't work out, two didn't work out, three didn't work out, and I'm pointing the finger at them, making them responsible for why it didn't work, not realizing that, wait a minute, when I point the finger, there are three fingers pointing back at me. So I've got to look at myself three times as hard as I do the other person. Now, if I don't have an understanding of what women are as a species in terms of their spirituality, in terms of their emotions, in terms of you know how they're wired, I may not know how to properly engage with a woman as I'm da dating her or courting her. So it requires that I have a general understanding of women in general, and by having friends who happen to be female, who I can gain wisdom and, and knowledge from on how to talk to a female, how to interact with a female, what is considered appropriate behavior to deal with a female, that would be good. But I also have to have some general knowledge about relationships overall. What does it take to be a good communicator? What does it mean to meet the emotional needs of another person? How do we begin to blend personalities so that it works for the betterment of that particular relationship? Understanding these four seasons will properly prepare you to have a successful relationship. So let's deal with the dating season. In the dating season, this is what we call the selection process. Now, interestingly enough, when I was younger, I would go on a date and there's a difference between dating, a, there's a difference between going on a date, which is a, a Friday night, six o'clock, we meet at a coffee shop and we're talking, that is a date versus dating. Dating a particular person represents another level of commitment within that season. So that means I find a particular interest in someone. Now we're dating. We're going on a few occasional dates at appropriate times and places where there's accountability and we're taking the time to get to know one another. It is the selection process. Now, one of the things that gets single people in trouble is that they don't want anybody in their business. What I do, but you know, in my own life is my own business and nobody else's business but my own. And that's where we get in trouble. Now think about the last time that you applied for a job. Now years ago, whenever you applied for a job, you could have an interview with a boss and if he liked you, he would hire you on the spot and say, can you start next week? And that's pretty much how that went. But that was years ago. Today, when you're applying for a job, you may interview with several members of that company. You'll interview with the headhunter, you'll interview with the manager, you'll interview with the supervisor of that particular department, you may interview with the owners of the company. Why? Why so many interviews? Because what they're doing is they're assessing you. They're seeing who you are and how you operate from different perspectives. And then they will all come together and make a unanimous decision as to whether they believe you are fit for that particular job. Don't forget, you have to submit a resume. And on that resume, there are your skill sets. There is your background, whatever other jobs that you've had. They're trying to assess who you are as a person. Um, because they want to know are you a proper fit. Now, one thing that's great about an interview, 
uh, you can lie yourself through an interview. I tell you, you can figure out just what to say in what manner to say it to get anybody to say yes. But see, that's why they put you on what is called a 90-day probationary period because they want to see, well, will you live up to all that you said in the interview? As impressive as your resume is, as impressive as, as your references may be, as, um, as impressive as you've been in this interview, now we have to see where the rubber meets the road. How do you function on a day-to-day -day, uh, um, level within the realm of this particular company? And so you're on a 90-day probationary period, and if you pass the test, then you can transition into something that is longer. But the point that I'm making is, in terms of having multiple interviews with different people, I personally believe this is just Hassani's opinion. There's no rhyme or reason in terms of some gospel. This is just my opinion. When you're dating someone, it would be good to have people who you trust, who you value, who you esteem, who you could go to for wise counsel to determine whether that person is qualifiable to be in a relationship. Because the reality is, if I like you and I'm attracted to you, most of us get into relationships based upon two things, physical attraction and emotional desirability. So as long as you look good and you make me feel good, then guess what? I'm in. But because I'm so emotionally attached to you, I may not see what others can see. So having wise counsel around you, people who mean you well, they can see things that you can't see. See, the closer you are to a tree, you can't see beyond that tree. But when other people are looking from a difference, from a distance, from different perspectives, they can have some level of insight. And I remember you know, when I uh, started dating my wife, Danielle, I was very particular about this. So I wanted to know what my mother thought, what my father thought, what some of my friends thought. I wanted to know how other people perceived her. Not that I would base my entire decision on the opinions of others, but, you know, wisdom is found in the counsel of many. And so because I made the decision to do that, I believe I've made the right decision. And it's proven itself to be true because we're married now, going on 15 years, four beautiful children. We built a powerful ministry together. We have purpose and destiny. And so it's very important in the selection process who you choose simply because the origin of a thing determines its nature. So if the relationship starts off wrong, then you have the foundation for a bad relationship. But if that relationship starts off good, you have the foundation for a good relationship. Now, that doesn't mean if it starts off bad, you can't rework some things and reconstruct some things, but it becomes much more challenging. So in terms of what is the most important season in a successful relationship, the dating season, committed courtship, engagement, or marriage, you know, it's really a person's personal opinion, but I truly believe that the dating season is one of the most vital seasons because that is the beginning of it. That is the selection process. And if you understand who you are and if you understand what you need for a successful relationship and then begin to seek that out, then you're uh, setting yourself up for success as opposed to setting yourself up for failure. So that represents the dating season, the selection process, okay? But then you transition into what we call committed courtship. This is the getting to know you phase. This is that opportunity for you to take your time and to see if you have shared views, shared values, shared experiences. Now listen, I want to talk about this because I think this is what gets many of us tripped up. Compatibility is not being just like your partner. So oftentimes in the course of the relationship, we're trying to win our partner over to being just like us, to thinking just like us, to reacting just like us. And now becomes a tug of war between that man and that woman because everyone is trying to be right. I say if you want a successful relationship, you've got to be willing to be wrong. If you're so committed to being right, both of you lose. But in that uh, committed courtship season, you're trying to see, do we have things in common? You know, the scripture says, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? So as long as we have shared values, shared faith, shared belief, then you know what? We have a phenomenal foundation because there's going to be times when I don't like you. 
<laughs> I can't stand you. We all go through seasons. But if we have a firm foundation, even when those, we, even when we're um, uh, we, we're experiencing ought against each other and challenges, we have a foundation that we can bounce back from and have something that's healthy and productive. That is what we will call the committed courtship season. All right. So now we're transitioning into the third season, which is the engagement season. Now this is what I call the season of preparation. Now once you've realized that this particular woman or this particular man may be the one for you, there should be a season where you kind of separate and prepare for the next season to come. You know, uh, the reality is I have to be a husband before I say I do. That woman should be a wife before uh, she says I do, meaning uh, you should seek the counsel of successful husbands and wives, learn from them about what it takes in terms of the duties and the responsibilities and the tasks of properly entering into that particular season. So I got to make sure that my finances are straight. I've got to make sure that I've got pretty good credit. Why? Because as I'm transitioning from engagement into the marriage season, everything shifts and changes. So, so let me make this point. In dating, committed courtship, and uh, engagement, it's all about the heartfelt connection, the relationship. But once you enter into marriage, now you're doing, dealing with duties and responsibilities and obligations, and they're two completely different things. I oftentimes draw the distinction between a relationship and a marriage. Now, a relationship, you're dealing with emotional fulfillment, okay? You're dealing with love, you're dealing with communication, you're dealing with the blending of personalities, and those take a number of skills that you have to get better at, or dare I say perfect, in order to have something that is successful. Well, now we're never perfect, but the point is you want to be skillful in those particular areas. But when you're thinking about a marriage, now you're thinking about money management, uh, financial planning, uh, delegation of responsibilities, raising a family. Uh, so you're dealing with more task duties and obligations. So they're different skills. There's so many people who have what we call great relationships, but horrible marriages. So they connect in terms of their heart, their emotions, their love, their sexual fulfillment, great communication. But in terms of their marriage and the way that the home life is structured, it is a wreck. But then you have other couples who have great marriages, money in the bank, bills paid, kids are being taken care of, they're moving forward in that particular area, but their relationship is horrible. There's no communication, no sexual fulfillment. They're just like two individuals who have drifted off and gone their separate ways. I often say we go from being soulmates to role mates to roommates, which represents emotional decline, emotional uh, disconnection. And that happens when we don't focus on the relationship. I say that we often give up our relationship for the sake of the marriage, meaning before I do, it was just you and I. We would talk, we would date, we would enjoy each other, we would uh, spend quality time together. But as soon as we said I do, the relationship became the last thing on our list of priorities because it's about what? Work and church and extracurricular and doing things for the kids. And that's when the transition shifts, particularly when we have children. Now, we love children. And that is an inheritance that God has given us. But the reality is children can be a love buster. Why? Because when we said I do, we put on our husband hat and our wife hat. But as soon as we had children, we took off the husband and wife hat and put on the mommy and daddy hat. So the love that we used to give each other, we now give to the child. The quality time that we used to give each other, we now give to the child. The resources that we used to give each other, we now give to the child. And so as a husband and wife, we become emotionally disconnected and all of our love goes downward. So now we have vertical relationships with our children, but no horizontal relationship with ourselves. That is why couples, when they're having children, go through the most pain, go through the most trials in the relationship. They feel like giving up, calling it quits, and just letting go because they don't realize that they're in a new season and they have to learn how to properly adjust. And so that is why we say that the principle that you should live by is to be a partner first and a parent second. Now, wait a minute, that's confusing. Are you saying that we should neglect our children? Absolutely not. But in terms of the structure, it should be partners first, parents second, because the marriage came before the children. The marriage came before the family. Now think, if I switch gears and say, you know what, later for you, I'm worried about my kids. 
and all of my love and attention goes towards my children. The children feel loved, but children from a very young age understand when something's wrong. They understand when there's discord and confusion between the husband and the wife, the mommy and the daddy. Now, they may receive the individual love from mommy and daddy, but they don't feel as if they're in a loving environment. And so that is why I say the best gift that you could ever give your child is the love that you have for one another. Because children learn through observation and participation. And when they grow up and become adults, they just follow in uh, the pattern that was created for them within their household. This is what we call the family marinade. What is a family marinade? Think about the last time that you made a meal. Now, if you wanted to do something different, maybe you went to the supermarket and you got some marinade. Now, I don't cook. I watch my wife. She does a great job. And we're going to keep it that way. So she may go and get chicken. And instead of frying it, instead of just baking it, she may get a marinade and she'll clean the chicken and take the marinade and mix it into the chicken inside that bowl. And then she'll put it in the refrigerator for a few hours or possibly overnight so that the marinade can soak and saturate into the meat so that when she cooks that chicken later, I can taste the flavor of the marinade or the flavor in the meat. So I'm enjoying this marinade as I'm eating the chicken. But all of us have what is called a family marinade, where we've been soaked and saturated into communication patterns, behavioral patterns, emotional reactions, uh, worldviews, perspectives, and we take that from our childhood into our adult relationships. So if you come from a different family background or a different family culture as I, when we come together, we clash because we come from two entirely different systems and they don't work as we're bringing those things in. So we have to recreate a new system that works for this union, that works for this marriage. See, what I'm saying requires a level of skill. And so it's important that no matter what season you're in, that you learn the proper season and the skill sets and the responsibilities associated with that season so that you can transition into the next season until you reach the final season. So now here's a question that I get all the time. Well, I understand the seasons now. Thank you. I appreciate it. But how long should I wait <laughs> before I get married? How long? Should I wait six months? Should I wait a year? Should I wait five years? Well, that's a very interesting question. I never like to put a time stamp on it because anytime you're dealing with absolutes, there's always someone who can uh, basically tell you why your absolute makes no sense because there's some statistic or some fact or some experience uh, that works against your absolute. So I don't like dealing with absolutes. Uh, but what I will say, however long you are together before I do, uh, you should be able to properly go through each one of those seasons. Now, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, personally, I feel that no one should even consider marriage unless they've been together for a minimum of a year. Minimum. Now, I know about those couples who met, fell in love, and went straight to the courthouse. I know about those couples who've been dating uh, for three months or six months, and you know what? I don't have no time. I'm, I'm grown. I've, you know, I, I, listen, I need to live my life. Let's go ahead and get married. I get that. In those time, and in those situations, many of them do work, but a lot of them do not work. Why? Think about it like this. If I'm growing a fruit tree, okay, what happens if I pick the fruit from the tree too early? Well, it's not ripe. If I bite into it, it's going to be bitter. It's going to be raw. It's not going to taste good. But what happens if I wait too long and I grab the fruit from the tree and bite into it? Now it's rotten. It's spoiled. Possibly there's worms in it. It's decolored. You know, the color has changed. I picked it too late. And I think what happens is a lot of times we're either jumping into committed marriages too early or we're eventually getting into these relationships or these marriages too late. So there's proper timing. Now, I can't tell you what that timing is. But I do believe that that timing should be dictated by these four seasons. So the question is, how do you go from being a date to being a mate? 
properly going through the four seasons of a successful relationship. So number one, the dating season. Number two, committed courtship. Number three, engagement. And number four, marriage. Now, when I say dating, for all of the believers out there, we're not talking about the world's way of dating. So I'm using a term that may not be in scripture. I'm using a term uh, that may be in the world, but I'm not talking about doing it their way. We're doing it based upon the principles that are founded in the word of God. And as long as you make that book final authority in your life, you don't have any problems. And so that is why I think it is important that we take our time to master. Listen, there are three relationships you've got to master. And then I'm going to close. Three relationships. First, you have the relationship with God. That is your vertical relationship. Okay. Number two, you have the relationship with yourself. That is your internal relationship. And number three, you have the relationship with your partner. That is your horizontal relationship. The problem is so many of us are so focused on these horizontal relationships that we never take the time to master the vertical or the internal relationship. Thus, when we get into trouble with our partner, we have no foundation to stand on. See, you can't love somebody unless you truly love yourself. You can't love yourself unless you know yourself. And you certainly can't know yourself unless you have a relationship with your father. And so it all starts with him. And when you become intimate with him and know him for who he really, are, for who he really is, he will show you who you are. And see, that relationship, that vertical relationship, then becomes the template of how you should engage with your partner. Now, I'm not talking about being religious and being, I'm talking about a spiritual connection, a relationship where there's intimacy with him. And when you're intimate with him and intimate with yourself, you're learning how to be intimate with your partner. So that is a, a section, a small sliver that we mentioned in the book, The Audacity of Marriage. It literally could be a book of its own. And that's one of the next books that I'm working for for singles. But I just wanted to give you something uh, that we talk about in this book. So if you've enjoyed what you heard, I once again encourage you to get the book, The Audacity of Marriage, 10 Principles to Lifelong Partnership. You can pick it up today on Amazon, either in paperback for $16.95 or on Kindle for $9.99. Listen, all of you, quick announcements. I want you to go on over uh, to our Facebook group, group, The Audacity of Marriage. You know, in that particular group, every single day we have great content. We have Facebook Live broadcasts. We have uh, posts and articles and videos that can really enhance you as an individual as well as your relationship. Just a quick few announcements. We have a cruise that we have just uh, launched that we're going to be doing in November. And so we encourage you to sign up for the cruise. The last time we did it, it was amazing. And we hope to have an amazing turnout this time because we're going to have an amazing time for those that do join us. We're going to be going to the Bahamas for three days, leaving out of uh, the Miami port. And I believe it's the first weekend in November. So make sure you sign up for that. For all of my Londoners, I know that there are those that are watching from the UK right now. I'm so excited that we're going to be joining you in just a few weeks. Uh, I'm so excited to be a, a part of a, a phenomenal growing ministry out there that's making a major impact. Uh, and so I want you to go on our Facebook page to find out more information about that. If you're in the area, definitely go. South Africa is on the way. The Caribbean, we just booked dates are on the way. So God is doing something and I'm glad to be a part of it. If you have any questions, please, please inbox me your question. Uh, any topic that you would like me to talk about, we can certainly do that. If you're in a relationship and you're going through a crisis uh, and you're on the verge of divorce, if you just experienced an affair, I want you to reach out to us. Go to our website, couplesacademy.org. Find out more about what we can do to assist you. I love you all, and I will see you next week. Good night.